to start. Thank you, Allie. Um, so we are recording this and we sent out an email so everybody had some uh, warning and um, to start with, while we're waiting for just the last couple people, if I could get you to go to this first QR code and uh, take the pretest, that would be great. And this is something I'm going to show you that's a resource that's available to everybody whenever you do a presentation with students or with faculty. So I'd love you to go in and take the pretest so you can experience it for yourself. And then when we finish the facts portion this morning, then I'll have you take the post test so you can see how that looks. So if you could go ahead and do that. I'll give you um, about three minutes to complete this. And when you finish the pretest, if um, Drew, do you want people to sign in or are you happy with just having the participant list? Um, I was just planning to use the uh, registrations as the participant list. I, I didn't see a need to have a yet another sign in on top of it, but- Okay, what... so you don't need to do the second uh, QR code. So just go ahead and do the first one, please, and do the pretest and I'll, I'll give you about three minutes to complete it and then we'll get started. Every time I take this, I wonder what's the difference between a faculty member and an instructor? Because aren't they both faculty? Um, yeah, that we can ask our external evaluator. She's, I know it's a struggle to try to come up with the categories that fit everybody and resonate with everybody. A lot of universities do make a distinction between faculty and instructors, if you're ten, if you're not tenure track, then you're not faculty. So it's one of those. A lot of universities you can yeah. be a teaching faculty but also, not a tenure. So yeah, but that's changing, Earl. Like there's so now they have yeah two lines of faculty, well, we tenure track and non tenure track, and then there's you know the adjuncts and the instructors and lecturers. Okay, so it's 10.05. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hopefully, people have had enough time to do the pretest. If you're still answering a few questions, that's fine. But I'm going to leave this screen, so you need to catch this uh, QR code if you need it, and then we could always throw the link back in the chat. Um, so um, what I'm going to, I'm going to start back here at the beginning. This is going to be, um, you're here today to learn about get the facts out. I lost um, some video, so I guess I just won't look at anybody. Um, so if you need me, you have to say something. And uh, this is a uh, partnership between four national societies, so the American Physical Society, and today we have Monica Plish and Michael Whitman with us, and they're the, the PIs, and then the American Chemical Society, and we have Terry Chambers here today uh, representing the PI for the American Chemical Society, uh, American Association of Physics Teachers, we have Mark Hannum and Drew Isola. Drew is very active on the project and also does He's the person who coordinated with you on, um, on everything getting started here today. And then for the Association of Mathematics Teacher Educators, we have Sherry Stacaro, and she's the PI. And, um, and then from the Colorado School of Mines, there's myself, Wendy Adams, and David May, who's now uh, full-time on Get the Facts Out at Mines, and we're pretty happy about that. So you've seen the pretest, and I'm gonna start by just sharing, teaching the best kept secret with you. We'll do a shorter version of it, maybe about 15 minutes. And there's a few updates in there. So even if you've seen this before, I think there'll be some things here that are new for you to see a little bit of new data on, um, and on the needs and on student interest that you haven't seen before. And then um, I'll share some of the latest and greatest resources. And David will share with you some of the examples of um, specific modifications and customizations people have done to the resources. So that's our plan this morning before we move into networking and your disciplinary discussion groups. So the rest of the day, you're gonna be talking and interacting with people. And this is the only time we really have set up where you're just gonna um, see a presentation, but it's interactive and there's lots of polls. So you'll still have things to do and you can ask questions in the chat and Drew and David and the other change agents that are here will be happy to answer your questions in the chat. So I'm gonna start by just um, with the presentation teaching the best kept secret. This is a presentation that has been built out and refined over three, four years now and shows um, really strong gains. So I'm gonna show you some of that data too. So to start with, I would, like to have you think about a ladder and rate your life. Now, normally I don't ask people to share their rating, but because we have so many people here 
and we have Zoom, which is anonymous, I am gonna ask you. So this will be new and different. So if you don't mind, if you could please um, rate, think about a ladder where the top step, the 10th step is the best possible life. Zoom only allows 10 options. And so I did not have zero as an option. One is the lowest option. So at this time, which step of the ladder would you say you personally feel you stand? And then after you've thought about that and answered that, there's a second question that says, five years from now, where do you think you'll stand? I concur with Dr. Mukherjee's information. And then once I have a good fraction of people um, and I'm going to go ahead and end it. I have about 67%. If anyone else wants to answer. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And I'm going to share the results just, um, just to see. It's not letting me see the, um, oh, I see. Great. So these, these look great. Uh, so there's the results. If you want to take a peek at those, so um, where do you think teachers rate their lives uh, on this ladder? And that's what we're interested in. Is Gallup has given this poll um, to 170,000 working Americans, and then divided out the results by occupation group. And sometimes it's divided out by other things, uh, maybe by geographic location or other demographic information. And in this case, they did it by occupation group. And so um, let's see where teachers rate their lives. So it looks like teachers rate their lives higher than all occupation groups trailing only physicians. And what they do is they take the people who rate themselves at the top step of the ladder and they subtract off the people who rate themselves on the bottom half of the ladder and they ignore the people who rate themselves in the middle of the ladder. So why is this? Why are teachers rating their lives so highly. And so we've uh, collected a lot of data from teachers and we've looked at a lot of data that other people have collected. And what we're finding is that um, work-life balance, student and colleague relationships and financial stability are some of the top key reasons why teachers are rating their lives so well. And so let's, today we're gonna try to unpack more of the detail behind this and see. So, and the, the really big thing is, Teachers make a difference. Behind every advance in medicine or technology is a teacher who left a lasting impression. And that's why we really like to do it and why we love doing it. So to start with, let's look at salaries and um, see if Zoom will let me have my polling back. Oh my goodness. There we go. So here is our two questions about teacher salaries. So to begin with, I'd like you to think about what you think the closest, what numbers closest to the typical starting salary for K-12 teachers in your area. And then once you answer that one, I'd like you to think about after 15 years of teaching and earning a master's degree, which do you think is closest to the typical K-12 teacher salary in your area? All right, so we already have um, 80% of people participating. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And instead of showing you what everybody else picked, I'm gonna just show you a few salaries. It's really nice if you can show local salaries. Um, and of course we have people from all over the country here today. So I'm gonna just, I just picked four places. Um, these are all places that we have uh, comprehensive study sites. So that's how I picked them. And so um, Salt Lake City School District, that's, within an hour of BYU, Monongolia County, West Virginia is near West Virginia University, which is one of our sites. Long Beach Unified is near CSU Long Beach. And then Boulder County Public Schools is um, right near Mines. And so these are some starting salaries with somebody who has a bachelor's degree and no experience. And uh, you can see it ranges between 40 and 60,000 here. And I think these are reasonably representative. Uh, West Virginia is one of the lowest paying areas uh, that we've seen in our, in our um, data mining. So I think these are give you a reasonable range. And then if we look at what teachers get paid after five years, 
so teachers have regular steps and they know when they start their job what kind of what to expect to be paid next year and the year after and the year after it's it's a negotiated part of their contract and so you can see at year five there's already um, very clear reasonable raises in place and you can also see that if you've earned a master's degree you get additional pay for having a master's degree and there are programs for teachers all over the country where they can earn a master's degree while they're a full-time practicing teacher and so it's very common uh, the data we see is that about half of teachers have a master's degree by the time they're 30. And so it's very common to expect a teacher to have a master's degree, which is why I put this on the on the chart at this point. And then if we want to see mid-career teacher salaries, uh, you can see that West Virginia is um, on the lower end. So in our data, data mining and our analysis, we see that mid-career teacher salaries range from the low 60s up to just over $100,000. That's the 25th to 75th percentile range. And we've been able to confirm that with National Center for Educational Statistics data as well. And so this, these uh, districts here are a good example. I've got a district that's below the 25th percentile on here, and I have a district that's above the 25th percentile, and the other two are right in there. And then you'll notice I said extra pay at the bottom because these salaries are all the base pay for a nine month teacher contract. This does not include if they do any extra duties, maybe they do a little bit of curriculum work in the summer or maybe they sponsor a club. And at the top, if a person was interested, you know, what would this work out to if this was, if someone actually had to work 12 months at this rate? And so I have the annualized numbers at the top for you to see. So extra pay, as college faculty, this seems a little alien to us, but at least it did for, to me when I first learned it. But there are also negotiated salary schedules for all of the extra duties that teachers have. And so if a teacher wants to sponsor a club or be a coach, they get um, a set amount that's already been determined. Or if they're going to sub for another teacher or if they're going to do some tutoring, there's a whole range of things that a teacher might, might do in addition to their classroom duties. And in each case, they have a um, specific negotiated amount. And our mining has shown us that the 25th to 75th percentile range for each of these duties is between one and eight thousand dollars but there are teachers who um you know choose to do more than one thing maybe they want to coach three sports and so you can um this number can get pretty large if a person wanted to do it or a person can choose not to do this and be happy with their base salary all right so this is another um, bit of salary data just to give you a feel for where teachers are at and so this number in the orange bar is the range of starting salaries that we found for teachers, again, 25th to 75th percentile. And this is a couple of years old to match the 2018 data here. So that number, those numbers are slightly higher now, but all of the numbers on this chart are from 2018 because that's when we can get the data for the other careers. And so you can see there's other careers here. Now, computer science is in a completely different range Something else to notice here is that teachers are the only ones on this chart that are a nine month contract versus a 12 month contract. All of these other salaries require a person to work 12 months out of the year. And that is a big difference. And I think that that um, definitely affects teachers rating of their well being and affects their um, ability to have a different kind of work life balance that other than other careers offer. All right, did you know that there are student loan forgiveness programs and scholarships for math and science teachers? There's federal loan forgiveness of up to $17,500 for teachers. And the rules for that are that you need to have five years of consecutive teaching and teach in a low income school in a high needs area. All math and science areas are considered high needs. And uh, there's really easy resources when you Google teacher loan forgiveness to see which schools qualify. And it's the vast majority of schools that qualify as low income schools. There's also Perkins loan forgiveness. This is a really nice program. The only problem is that a couple of years ago, no, they quit giving out new Perkins loans. So you're still going to have some students at your university who um, have received Perkins loans and this forgiveness is good for them. But here pretty soon, um, your students who've had the Perkins loans will have graduated and moved on. And this will only affect career changers at that point because they're no longer giving out Perkins loans. But it's very nice because there's forgiveness beginning with your first year of teaching. And by the time you teach five years, it's fully forgiven. And the entire time, 
um, it's in deferment, so you pay no interest and no payments. There's also teach grants available for people who know they want to teach and you qualify for financial aid, then you can get $4,000 a year as a teach grant. If a person doesn't teach, this requires a commitment of, I think, four years of teaching within the first eight years of graduating, then it converts to a student loan. So if you think there's any chance you're going to teach, then it makes sense to get a teach grant and you're planning to get a student loan. Um, if you want to know more, it's easy to Google and you can find out more about these programs and they're utilized very regularly by teachers. These aren't uh, like some other programs you might have heard about that are hard to get. These are all um, these are all fairly well managed. OK, did you know that most teaching jobs have better retirement benefits than other jobs you can get with the same degree? Teachers in the U.S. retire on average at age 59, and that's compared to age 63 for all other occupations. So teachers on average across the whole U.S., the, you know, there's two million plus, or three million plus teachers in the U.S. On average, they're retiring four years earlier than other careers. So here's an example of retirement benefits. It's different in every state, but every state does offer a pension plan. And Drew's written a really nice blog article about this on our website. And there's also a, links to a uh, table that shows you how to calculate the retirement benefits for your state. But if you ever have any trouble doing it, you can just shoot us an email and we're happy to help you. But here's an example in Colorado, they offer what's called PARA. And PARA, if a person begins teaching at 22 years old, they'll be eligible for full retirement benefits at age 57. Um, it only takes five years to get vested. Once you're vested, the rules can't change on you. Um, and then once they do retire, the minimum they'll receive is 87.5% of their highest annual income. But if they continue to teach for a few more years, that percentage keeps going up and you can go up to 100%. Um, and that's considered, that's what's called a pension, is that you're going to get this payment as long as you as long as you live. So you don't have to try to estimate how long you live and calculate how to spread out your money. You're going to receive this and it comes with automatic cost of living raises every year. So it will track with inflation. So we had um, an alumni who said, there's a way to put a number to this. There's a way to make this match up and look like 401k retirements or other types of retirements. So let me figure that out. And he came up with this nice spreadsheet that it, we tried to do very conservative estimates on every end. And he found that a person would have to save $21,600 a year the entire time they're working to be able to retire at age 57 and receive the same pension as the person who taught that entire time. <coughs> that is a substantial amount of money that you're putting away for retirement. So this is a, a way to get a number value on that pension and to see what a tremendous benefit it is. And um, if you're going to teach for your career, I, I haven't seen a state where it's not um, a much bigger benefit to have a state pension plan than it is to have your typical 401k. Um, so here is another poll for you all, and that is to think about teacher retention. So let me switch my polling question and give you a chance to Put your prediction in here. What fraction of grade seven through 12 teachers remain in the profession at year five? Ah, I see there are a lot of people who have seen this before. That's great. This is the, the best I've seen this. This is excellent. Okay. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. So the answer is 78%, the Department of Ed um, did a really large study because there were so many numbers floating around where people had made estimates looking from year to year. And it's just very hard to estimate this. So they just followed a wave of teachers for five years and they interviewed them every year. And they, they learned a lot of things, but one of them was about retention. And they found that by year five, 78% of the teachers in their wave that they started following were still in the classroom. And so these are the people in the classroom this doesn't even, sorry, there's a fly. This doesn't even address the fact that some of these people may have moved into administrative positions or other positions within um, K-12 education. So these are 78% are still in the classroom and we have worked and worked and worked to try to find equivalent data in other careers. And we've, we've come pretty close, not quite as good as this study. And what we're finding is that the only careers that um, look like they have stronger retention in this are in the health professions. 
but um, other careers, engineering, science, professional careers do not have the kind of retention that teaching does. So teaching has teachers rating their lives better than all occupation groups, trailing only positions, and it also has better retention than all the occupation groups we found other than the health professions. How about another poll here? So I'm gonna stop sharing and switch to this one. What fraction of teachers do you think report having at least some control over content, topic, and skills to be taught? And then the next one asks you, what fraction of teachers report having at least some control over selecting teaching techniques? So the first one's content, topic, and skills, and the second one is teaching techniques. And again, I see a lot of my friends here who have seen this and probably given this presentation themselves. Okay, so we're pretty good. We have about 75%. So I'm going to show you uh, the answer here. So 90% of teachers are reporting that they have control over content, topic, and skills to be taught. And 95% of teachers are reporting that they have some control over selecting teaching techniques. And this is from a 2017 Educator Quality of Work Life survey um, that was done by a teacher's union and also the Badass Teachers Association. So this is where we got that data. We've been looking for other sources as well, and we really haven't found others. I'm sure there are, so we'll keep looking for that. Um, so here's another question that also came from the same survey. And so I'm going to switch questions here. What fraction of teachers somewhat agree or strongly agree with the statement, I am treated with respect by parents and students? All right, looks like we have 70%. So I'm gonna go ahead and call that good. And again, it looks like you guys know your stuff. So in the same survey, it actually was two different questions. One asking if they felt treated with respect by parents and one asking if they felt treated with respect by students. And the results were almost exactly the same for the two. So that's why I just put it into one question. When asked if they felt treated, um, treated with respect by their colleagues, it was very high, it was in the high 90s. And when they were asked if they felt treated with respect by the media, um, it was very low, it was like 50%. So it was definitely a range in how teachers responded. So get the facts out is, um, our motivation is that there is a severe shortage of physics, chemistry, and math teachers. And to give you some data on that, 66% of chemistry teachers do not have a major in their assigned subject area or they lack teacher certification. And then for physics, it's 63%, so pretty close to the same. And for math, it's 38%. So math doesn't look quite as bad here, but that still means almost half of math teachers do not have a major in math or they lack certification. And so that's why we are doing this project because we want to fix this. We want highly qualified teachers teaching every student in this country to give everybody the opportunity to pursue STEM if they want to. And you can't do that if you don't have a decent high school preparation. So um, the, it's, I was very concerned when I first saw this data. Um, this is thanks to my colleague, Michael Martyr in Texas. He pulled together Title II data to see this, but you can see not only do we have a severe shortage of physics, chemistry, and math teachers, but the problem is getting worse, not better. And so you can see declining teacher preparation. These are numbers of teachers prepared, both traditional and alternative licensure programs. It's just total numbers prepared, period. And you can see a, a, a dramatic drop in math, and there's also been a drop in science. And I have data in here that's by a discipline that's in a hidden slide that if you want to look at it, um, you can later because it'll be in our shared folder that you'll have a link to here a little bit later. So here's a question for you. So we're seeing the numbers of people being prepared dropping. We know there's a severe shortage. So what do you think the interest is from students? Do you think that STEM students, what fraction of STEM students do you think are interested in becoming a teacher? So I have data from asking them this question here, how interested are you in being a middle or high school teacher? But we also have some other data that's um, much more complete and thorough. 
So, all right, so we have about 70% coming in. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the poll and I'm gonna share some data. So this is our data. This is the data from, well, from a lot of you really, this is um, 2,300, almost 2,400 students from universities across the country who collected data on the um, PTAP, the perceptions of teaching as a profession. And from that data, we see that 62% of the students who responded are either pursuing certification or have clear interest in becoming a teacher. And when I say clear interest, they agree with or strongly agree with a statement similar to, I would if the salaries were similar to other careers I could get with the same degree, or I would if I could retire comfortably by age 60. And those statements are true. And so these are the people who, if you can get the facts out to them, these are your prospective teachers. These are the people who, who would join your program if many of them will join your program if we could just clear the air and um, let them know what the profession is really like. And then they can actually make uh, an informed choice between what they want to do. And then there's also another 20% who were not clear in their indications about whether they want to teach or don't want to teach. And so we put them into this category where we just really don't feel comfortable classifying them one way or another. And there's a very clear 18% who don't want to teach. And that's fine. Teaching is not for everybody. There's, here's some data from the panel on public affairs report from 2017, where they asked the specific question, how interested are you in being a middle or high school teacher? And they asked just majors in general. They weren't people who were associated with teacher preparation programs in any way. It was just majors in general with an outreach through national societies. And they, you can see that there's a higher fraction of math and physics majors who are interested than computer science, for example, but they're all still falling in that 40 to 60 percent, 40 to 50% range. So I would argue the 40 to 60% question is, or answer is the correct one here. And that is what um, almost half of you said. So our project motivation is that STEM majors are interested, but they're not pursuing teaching. And the top three reasons not to teach that we found in our research is salaries, retirement, and job satisfaction. But the top reason to, to teach is different. It's because students want to make a difference. So some people are nervous about advertising the salaries, the retirement, and job satisfaction. We're not saying that that's why people decide they want to teach. That's why people close the door on something that they actually are interested in and, and would really enjoy doing. So we just need to first clear the air, let them know about salaries, retirement, job satisfaction. Once we do that, then we can start talking about what really interests them, which is student relationships and making a difference and giving people opportunity to pursue STEM or do other things in their life, but giving them that opportunity. So that's our motivation here at Get the Facts Out is we wanna start celebrating the positives of the profession so that students who are interested can pursue STEM if they want to. So now here's a new question. This is some new data that a lot of you may not have seen yet. But do you believe these pictograms of prospective teachers? So that's the one that shows the interest in this, those pursuing certification. Do you believe that these will vary by race and ethnicity? So here, I gave you three options here. I wanna see what you think. Okay, so we've got 80% coming in. So let's, I'm gonna share this and let you see it's pretty evenly split. So we did analyze our data and divide it by how students identify. Um, we have a single question with multiple check boxes. So a student can identify um, as multiple, um, multiple options or a single option, or they can choose other and fill in um, their preference. And so we analyzed our data based on that. And so if I look at just the students who identified as only white, that's 1,500 of our 2,500 students, uh, we see 60% are interested in becoming a teacher. So let me move my poll out of my way here. And then if we look at the students who identify as Hispanic and only Hispanic, uh, it is significantly larger. And we have looked, um, used a chi-squared and looked at this, and it is significantly uh, larger 
at a very strong p-value um, that Hispanic students are showing more interest in becoming teachers. And they um, have a much, uh, they have a significantly smaller group in the not interested category. And then for students who identify as Black or African American, the number is also higher, but we, um, the p-value was, was not quite to um, 0.01. So we're, if we get more numbers, we can see, but the trend is in that direction. And we're also seeing it for Asian and Asian American students are also indicating more interest. And this was significantly smaller number of those who do not wanna teach for the Asian Americans that was significantly different. So we are seeing differences. Uh, we're seeing differences and it looks like students of color are in general more interested in teaching than white students. And so our argument is we've always felt it's important to let students know that teaching is a career option if they wanna become a physics major or a chemistry major or a math major. They should know and it should be right on the table that teaching is a career option. And you can see from the large interests from all these different groups that if you're not, when you're recruiting to your department, if you're not mentioning that teaching is a career option, um, you're probably gonna lose students out of these groups because there's a lot of interest in teaching as a career. And many of these students aren't gonna pursue teaching as a career. So they will be your majors who do other things as well. But if you don't let people know that teaching is a career option, and they've got this strong of interest in becoming a teacher, you're gonna lose a lot of majors. So um, our answer to this one is uh, yes, white STEM students are less interested in teaching compared to other groups. And then, um, okay, so we need to start celebrating the positives of the profession. And so what we do here, as most of you know, is we've been developing resources and testing them and researching them and sharing them for several years now to help you Get the facts out so that your students can then pursue their interest in making a difference and having relationships with students and making this their career. So before we move into those resources, um, I'd love it if you could take the post workshop quiz. So um, maybe David could throw the link in the chat again for those of you who'd like to click the link to do it. So I'm going to give you just a few minutes to complete the post quiz. And when you complete that, then we'll talk a little bit about the latest and greatest resources that are available. And I think some of them will be new that you haven't seen before. And once you finish your post test, if you could just put done in the chat, that'd be fantastic. Thanks.
Okay, so I think we've got close to the majority of people putting it done in there. So hopefully it's okay to move on for you all. So um, we're gonna start celebrating the positives of the profession. And so I'm gonna just show you, we'll, we'll just briefly talk about the presentations for faculty, staff, and students because you're familiar, a lot of you are familiar with those, but I just have a little bit of data to show you on that. And then we'll talk a little bit about the data handouts, teacher salary data, our professional videos that have come out this year. And there's another one that'll be coming along here really soon in the next month. They just finished the music. And then um, strategies and tips, there's a new section in there. And of course, these are designed for you to use with your students, but also there are several things here that are designed for you to use with your colleagues. If you'd like to share information with your colleagues so that they um, realize that this is actually a really great profession for your very best students to go into. So um, the faculty presentation is what you saw, teaching the best kept secret, but there are different lengths available on the website. There's a 15 minute version and then there's also the 50 minute version. 50 minutes is ideal. 15 minutes is if you just don't have enough time um, to cover the whole thing. But faculty really do like to have the opportunity to dig into the data if they can give given the time. And then there's a creating a new champion, which is actually what we're gonna do in this whole period here because I'm gonna show you the resources. So those of course are longer because I have to show you the resources. Um, for the student presentation, um, it's also, both of these have been updated a lot in the last year and a half because we do everything online now. So they're both designed to work really nicely online with polls or you can use chat for people to vote. And, um, and that way you don't have to be in person, but if you go in person, then they, they convert great. So this students are concerned with a narrower set of topics than what we covered today. So really just uh, salaries, job satisfaction and retirement. So this one's a little bit more streamlined. Again, a 15 minute version, a 30 minute version. And we also have some slides on the site if you wanna just do one or two minutes at the beginning of class. And so this is what I'm, I really want to make the plug for. And Stephanie Chastine, our external evaluator really wants me to make this plug. Um, please use the pre-post test that is embedded in the slide deck. It's already in there, it's ready to go. You can see what the slide looks like. And um, this way you can get data on how your presentation went. And Stephanie will uh, analyze the data for you and send it to you about a week after you do your presentation. You do have to register. You just There's a link in your slide deck to tell her that you did it and how many people were there and who your target audience was. And that way she can give you valuable feedback. And so this is a really, I love this. It's very helpful. I have students give presentations all the time for us for outreach at Minds. And so it's really nice to be able to see how they're doing and see if, if they're, they're able to be effective. And um, Stephanie will email you your results on the slide. So what makes a big impact are these two presentations. The teaching is the best kept secret for faculty and busting myths about the teaching profession for students. Uh, we've been working on these presentations. I mentioned on the faculty one for three to four years and the student presentation. We've been working on that for about five years. It's had multiple iterations. We've tested it for its um, impact and for its long-term impact. And we know that it works as it's laid out and as it's designed. Um, I don't know if it works to pull one slide out or to just pull one fact out. I do know I've had iterations of this that don't work well, that, that backfired. So if you can, I recommend using the slide decks as designed. And when you do, what we're finding is Stephanie's gotten lots of data from people and found that normalized gains are around 55 to 60% with a typical effect size of two, that is really big effect size. And so they, they do work and they do make a big impact. They're an efficient way to share the facts and uh, get people starting to see teaching for what it is. Um, and we've had these, this data comes in from a variety of people, not just, not just from project staff. So they're effective in the hands of whoever presents them. And um, I already mentioned that we use effective research-based practices, and we've tested it with multiple audiences um, hundreds of times. So we've got the presentations, and then we have data handouts. And this is something I have always used with students, and I find it to be my best tool, especially when you're having a conversation and you're face-to-face -face or you just run into somebody. I actually just carry these in my backpack. They're just with me all of the time. And we never had them as their own section on the website until about a month ago, before they were buried in with the presentations. So I made them their own section because 
I wanted to encourage you to use them because they have all of the data from the presentation. So when you have a conversation with somebody, it's so handy. And we find students get really excited about these. They want to take them and they ask if it's okay if they share them with their parents. Of course, it's okay if they share them with their parents. So I recommend that you, um, you use these. Most of them can be used as is, but one of them has uh, retirement information on it. So you'll want to update that with your state's retirement data. And another one has some teacher salaries here. So you'll want to update that with your teacher salaries. And the good news is that we now look up your teacher salaries for you, so you don't have to do that. So we now have a whole new section on the site that just came up a couple of weeks ago. And we have people we have hired who just, if you ask for teacher salaries in your area, they will look them up for you and they will send you a slide for the presentation, just like this one. And they will send you um, a teacher's life by the numbers infographic. And so here's the URL, but it's all over our website. But here's what an infographic looks like. It shows you what teachers will get paid um, in your county. We do it by county. Um, as a first year teacher with no experience, as a 15th year teacher with a master's degree. And then we show the average annual wage from the Bureau of Labor Statistics for that area. So this is a particularly high area. Um, normally this is gonna be in the high 40s to 50s. The median home value in that county, so again, a high area and the median rent this is the fair market value rent uh, put together by HUD um, for a two bedroom apartment. And then here we have an example of a home a first year teacher can buy. So we look at solds on Zillow to see what a first year teacher can buy with a 5% down payment. And then here's what a mid-career teacher can buy with a 20% down payment because um, Zillow says that's typical. And also at 15 years, we've talked to real estate agents. By then, um, you might have owned a home already and have the opportunity to put that 20% down. So that's how we pick these. So those are the new infographics that are available. There's a map on the website where you could pick your area. If, you're, if it's not there for your area, put in a teacher salary re data request and we will get it for you. And then you can update all of your slides and your handouts uh, with the current data for your area. So we also have um, professional videos that have been made. So we've got um, one here with Adria, who talks about why she decided to pursue teaching and get the facts out was a big part of that because she's a graduate from Mines. Oh, we have Taylor here, um, who uh, was a physics major and decided to pursue teaching. And then we have a general video just kind of covers the key facts. And it has you hear from um, a lot of different teachers and a lot of different um, STEM fields in this video. And then we have a video of uh, a high school teacher talking to a college faculty member. And we'll have some more videos coming out with an industry professional talking to a teacher about the different facts. And there'll be a different chapter for each fact that you can use as part of a presentation or, or whatever makes sense for you. And we're also posting on the YouTube channel examples of what you all are doing with videos and also our research videos. We're gonna post this presentation on there as well. So um, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and, and check out the videos. Then our poster series was updated this year and this is designed so that you can put your own logo and contact information down here. You could even modify the colors to match. It's basic PowerPoint, nothing fancy on PowerPoint. This is easily editable to um, put your contact in your color scheme. And then strategies and tips, we've always had the how to reach students section, which has been modified a little bit to reflect virtual uh, recruitment efforts. And then taking the next step is a new section on the website that is uh, talks about uh, the different things you can encourage a student to do who maybe came to you and said they're interested in looking into the career. What can they do next? And it gives you advice on baby steps all the way up to, to enrolling in a program. And then we of course have our tested messaging on there. Uh, so that uh, just the ways that you can talk about the facts that have tested well with a wide range of students and faculty. And then there's just recommendations there on how to share your passion um, about, you know, for teaching with your students and how important that is. So our website also, uh, we launched a new website in August that um, has all of this information and we're pretty excited about it and it's easy for us to update it. So it's getting updated much more quickly and much more often now. And then we have launched a listserv because we keep hearing from people who are using the resources that they want a way to talk to each other. And so we're trying to do that. So we've set up a Facebook page and we've been trying to be really active on that the last month or so. And 
we've we've been getting some people posting some questions and getting some feedback so that's really exciting and then we have a listserv so we're hoping these are venues that are, that you want that are going to be helpful to you so um let i have another poll here so before i say any more i would like to launch this so um Go ahead and answer these. I have two questions for you. One of them is, are you a member of this new listserv? And the address for it is community at getthefactsout.org. And then the next question is, have you been reading the updates that I send each week on the listserv and are they useful? Okay, so we have 80% um, of people. So I'm gonna share this. So I think, so I, if you're a registered champion and most of the people here are, you should be on there. But if you um, aren't and you would like to be, just shoot us an email and we'll get you subscribed. And it looks like, um, they're either useful or some of them are useful. So that's encouraging too. And this is anonymous. So you could tell me that they, they aren't. Um, okay, so there's the, uh, the, I had that question just for you all. We've got the Facebook group. It's just called Get the Facts Out and it's a group. We also have a Facebook page that's not active because we realize people can't post. So the Facebook group and we post facts, memes that you can share. We post, um, demo ideas, thinking questions, all things that you can share in your classroom or use in your teacher preparation. So hopefully those things are useful for you as well. And we're hoping that you'll start um, sharing things. And we've, we've had some people who've been sharing what they've been doing on there, which is perfect. That's exactly what we wanna use it for. So it's a place to really just share things and get them out there. And um, you know, there aren't random people on there. It's just people like you and I who want